All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, excited to be talking to an individual who competes at BKFC 41, and that goes down on April 29th. A heavyweight bout that I'm very intrigued by, and I think that's a sentiment shared by many as Ben Rothwell and Josh Copeland knuckle up and toe the line and great having Josh on the show. How's your day going so far there, man? Hey, so far so good. Got to sleep in and uh, just got done with my hard sparring. So got to finish finish up the week uh, hitting it hard. And who have you been, I guess, predominantly getting in that hard sparring work with ahead of this BKFC 41 card? Uh, today I had my buddy Martin in. He's a, he's a big 6'5", uh, good boxer. So uh, get some work in with him. Um, working in with Mohammed Usman, Kamaro's brother. Uh, he's been in there, Grant Neal, and uh, another teammate named Hammer. So we've been pushing each other hard. I mean, it definitely sounds like a great crew. And, I mean, this fight definitely seemed to, you know, pan out pretty well for you. I mean, you already had about lined up for that card against Steve Herelius and everything. So already preparing for this card and everything. But when did you get word that Ben Rothwell would be the opponent? Well, they so they originally gave me Steve uh, weeks ago. I probably I'd say eight to ten weeks ago, and then probably about three four weeks into that, uh, my manager hit me up uh, asking if if I would fight Ben Rothwell, and I said absolutely. And uh, um, I'd say that probably went on for about two weeks, thinking that I was in on that. And then they wound up going in a different direction, uh, of course, with uh, Watson. And then, so I was back on with Steve. And then last Tuesday night, my manager, uh, Brian Butler, hit me up asking, hey, uh, Ben Rothwell's opponent pulled out. What's, uh, what do you think about uh, fighting Ben? And I said, let's do it. So he asked uh, where my weight was. I was 255 pounds. And uh, I usually like to come in around 245, 250. But, uh, yeah, they said, if I want to fight, I got to get up to 270. So instead of uh, dropping another 5, 10 pounds, um, I am gaining. So here we go. I'm eating away. That's interesting. So is this almost like a different division then? Because it's kind of curious that it would be like a, you know, 270 kind of marker for where you would want to be at for that so this is like te- almost like technically a super heavyweight fight i guess or apparently my, i'm assuming ben's probably walking around at 300 around there uh just because um i think it's it's the commission that won't allow the fight to happen if we're too far uh too much of a weight difference so i asked bare knuckle hey uh what about Ben uh, dropping seven pounds and I'll go up eight pounds? And uh, they said, nope, we're not asking him to do anything. If you want to fight, you got to you gotta put it on. So, uh, hey, beggars can't be choosers. So I'm doing what I need to do to make it work. Yeah, I mean, definitely one of like the bigger, at least like emergent, like heavyweight names and everything like that. So I would think that fighting someone like that in your weight division is almost like something you can't pass up like obviously a well-traveled veteran too with over 50 MMA fights across UFC IFL etc so yeah I kind of get what you're saying in that sense if that's like a fair way to characterize it correct yeah that's to me it's I'm, I'm 40 years old now and uh I know I still got some fight left in me but I don't want to waste my time um fighting fighting nobody's I know that I can compete with some of the best in the world and I do it all the time and uh I just yeah I want to fight some big names and let's let's see what I can do yeah and a lot that I want to get into with this particular fight but I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the you know BKFC debut as well it seemed like an emphatic finish in the third round there over Levi Costa just putting him away there and everything and it seemed like a special moment to you in a few different regards there so can you kind of you know speak to that like some of the main takeaways from the BKFC debut there 
That, that one was big. I know uh, I hadn't fought in front of my Colorado friends and family in a long time. Uh, and so it was special in that regard. Um, of course, I watched Levi's uh, first fight, and I remember all the all the guys asking me leading up to it, all the reporters, uh, hey, so w- what do you think about Levy's uh, um I'm sure you watched his first fight. Uh, did you see any holes that uh, you you intend to exploit? This and that. And uh, to me, it's like, well, shoot, man. He uh, he stayed composed under pressure, threw good straight shots, good combinations. Uh, th- there wasn't much to exploit. The fight was over so quick. So I know, l- literally, the only thing that I knew going into that fight was that. Uh, Josh, the, his first opponent, Josh Sanchez, isn't Josh Copeland. Uh, he doesn't move the way I move and do the things that I do. So that, that was the only confidence that, that I had going into that, just believing in my skills there. So, um, yeah, it was nice to get the W over Levy. And, um, yeah, moving on. It's interesting you said you didn't get to compete in the area you know, quite as much prior to that last one, just with this sophomore BKFC bout being in the same arena you made that debut, and I would think that would be an exciting component for you. Yeah, that was huge. I, I, I love being able to fight here. It was cool just to see all the fans and uh, all the support I had. Yeah, so that's something that really like galvanizes you when you're getting out there, because I know sometimes for certain fighters it can be almost like a bit stressful and stuff like that. Like Maybe they prefer being the away player, but you feel like it almost emboldens something extra in your already, I guess, like motivated and directed approach, I guess. Well, it's always the catch-22, though, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. It's You always have pressure on you. No matter where you're at, people are watching. So it's... Uh, um, but being able to fight in your hometown and especially be able to come away with a knockout... It's just cool for me to be able to give back to all my friends and family, put on a good show, and uh, all the people that have been there from day one support me. It's it's uh, it's cool to put smiles on their faces. Yeah, I saw you got that coveted Justin Gaethje hug as well. That seemed pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, Gaethje's awesome, man. He's he's uh, we came up in the gym together. I'm proud of him. And an interesting component, too, just being that it was a return to a new combat sport, but also returning to competition for the first time in close to three years. So that had to have been an interesting experience, just kind of like reacquainting yourself to, you know, everything and all that. Correct. Yeah, that's, uh, I was worried about a little ring rust or whatnot, but honestly, I felt just fine in there. So it was from, uh, my last fight was over in Russia, and then... I was training for another one the following year in June, and then a uh, good old March happened in 2020, so that put a huge damper on things. So, uh, yeah, it's nice just to get back active, and um, I just love competing, so... Yeah, for sure, and it seemed like that initial go-around was kind of like a, you know, one-fight deal as well, and definitely, like you said, seems like you're, you know, very much excited to, you know get back to it I'm kind of curious just with this being someone who's an opponent ranked in the top five at heavyweight albeit it's like a bit beyond the heavyweight threshold but still that being said I would think a win here would kind of get you in that you know top five rankings conversation like how much of your pursuit here is oriented to I guess like climbing the ranks for like championship contention versus say taking on like big tests and I guess money fights for lack of a better way to phrase that sentiment well that's uh I mean, it's like I told you, I'm 40 now and uh, still feeling good. But I know that my my window of opportunity is uh, getting smaller and smaller. So, uh, hey, I, I would love to be able to climb these ranks and and uh, go go get a go get that belt, of course. So that's that's the goal. And uh, man, I. I just love the opportunity. I know when I heard they were coming back, that Bare Knuckles coming back to to Denver, I reached out to my manager and uh, I got the text. It was probably 12 weeks ago saying, hey, uh, just because 
I know Michael told my manager, hey, with the win or two, uh, that, that could set Josh up for a title shot. Well, I know if it's in another win, I'm going to have to beat a big name. Um, or two, give me a Levi Costa, then a Steve Aurelius, then fight the big name, and then go for the belt. So uh, when when I messaged my manager, I, I asked him, hey, what's, what's your thoughts of uh, me getting set up with Ben Rothwell or Greg Hardy uh, to see if we can get that title shot after this? And um, that was that was my intentions from the very beginning. And, uh, yeah, that, hey, it, it wound up coming through, so I'm excited. Yeah, and I'd be curious to, you know, get some insights on this opponent because like you, he is also 1-0 and in BKFC and he very much asserted himself in the picture just as you did. Like, what were your thoughts on, I guess, his BKFC debut? I mean, not really, I guess, much to make inferences on or form a game plan around per se, or maybe I'm wrong in that characterization. What were the main, I guess, takeaways from his debut there? Well, uh, same thing. It was over so quick. Uh... You know, Ben did a good job of uh, staying long and, and, and using his, his uh, reach, uh, throwing good, hard, fast combinations, and uh, the other guy couldn't take it. So, uh, same thing, I just know uh, uh, I move different than anyone else. So, that's, that's the confidence I got going into this. And I'm curious, like, what specifically do you mean by that? Like, just, like, a unique footwork pattern or just, like, the specific kind of athleticism you have, like, the actual speed? Or, like, what do you mean, I guess, in that regard? Yeah, I mean, the the way I like to fight is based off of footwork, timing, and angles. When I first started uh, MMA, I never wanted to be just the heavyweight that stood in front of someone and hope mine lands first. And to, to me, that's anyone's game, just standing toe-to-toe and uh, swinging from the hips. And, you know, the the moral of the story, it's like uh, not always the best fighter wins either. So uh, I just like to, instead of just taking the chance and hoping mine lands first, I like to set things up and move, create angles and uh, – set my shots uh, versus just throwing big, big long combinations and yeah, bull rushing. Yeah, definitely a more like career longevity minded and fight IQ minded way to pursue it. And I guess kind of also within that conversation, I'm curious if like the preparations are differing at all in this sport and I guess maybe even between camps because like I know some fighters coming over to bare knuckle will use like the wooden Muay Thai boards or punch sand, grip rice, different things of that nature, like create certain micro fractures and stuff like that. Like does your preparations differ at all in that regard? Like do you add certain things into your camp preparing for certain BKFC fights as compared to say past MMA fights, I suppose? Uh, Honestly, I haven't. Um, I, I use Trevor Whitman's Onyx gloves, and th- those are gloves that you don't need hand wraps for. So I, f- I feel that I have good, strong hands. I've been using those for years, hands and wrists. Um, I haven't done any of the extra special stuff, I would say. Um, I just think uh, a lot of it's picking and choosing your shots, <laughs> uh, not throwing things that you hope are going to land and um, yeah, stay away from cracking the top of their forehead or, or their elbows, you know. And I would think your familiarity with, like, the high altitude would be a big variable for you here. Like, you talk about how, I guess, your game plan is very centric on movement and athleticism. And I guess being familiar with the area, I think it would, you know, pay dividends to your game plan, just how used to that area you are, I would think. Uh, true, but I, I know that Ben came out what he's he came out like three and a half weeks before the fight so he's out here getting uh acclimated it's not uh it's not like uh elevation's gonna be uh be on my side in that regard so they say it takes about two weeks to get acclimated to the elevation and he'll be out here a good three and a half weeks so i don't know that i'll really have the advantage there but uh yeah i just We'll see what happens. 
And something that just as you were saying it, I find kind of intriguing, like you talk about using Trevor Whitman's special gloves and having used them for a meaningful enough period of time whereby you don't even need the wraps. Like I found Ben Rothwell also had like a comparable sort of transfer over to bare knuckle where he didn't really even use much in terms of like, like the wrapping and being too preoccupied with that. So kind of interesting, like how much of that, I guess, lent itself to, you know, transferring over into bare knuckle, just like familiarity with, I guess, that end of things and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. Honestly, I know, uh, it's worth it to have good, strong hands in this sport. That's for sure. So I feel, I feel mine are good and strong enough. So, but, uh, we'll see what happens if I crack the forehead. I might have a, have a different story for you. <laughs> yeah. It seemed like your hands were surprisingly pretty good after the first fight per an account you had there. So, I mean, knock on wood, hopefully that's the case. And both of you, you know, come out as healthy as one can from bare knuckle fighting. But I guess just one of the last things I wanted to touch on here, because I definitely enjoy the nickname Cuddly Bear. And I'm curious about nicknames in general, just like the origin story and just, you know, who gave it to you and what the reasoning is, etc. So curious to get some insights on why you're known as Cuddly Bear. Of course. Well, I know, uh, so I, I went to college for youth ministry. And uh, I've always had a heart and passion for people. And I went to college uh, up in Louisville, Kentucky, the undergrad of Southern Seminary at Boyce Bible College. And then my last couple of years at Dallas Baptist University in Texas. And uh, I've just always been a happy, go lucky guy. And, um, one day I was uh, riding with Trevor Whitman coming back from wrestling practice in Boulder. And uh, Trevor said to me, he's like, Josh, we got to we gotta come up with a nickname for you. And I've always been one of the people that, well, I don't want to come up with my own nickname. And uh, um, because I didn't have a nickname, there was a few times early, early in my career where the announcer would uh, call me the juggernaut or some big rough and tough name that I really didn't care for. Um, <laughs> I, I told Trevor that uh, I always wanted something that represents me as a person, not not just some big, scary axe murderer guy, right? And uh, um, I told him that every time I get on the mats to go do jujitsu with Alvin Robinson, which Alvin was one of uh, Hoist Gracie's first black belts, Alvin would always uh, say, oh, here comes the bear. And I told Trevor I didn't like that because uh, that sounds a little too mean. I'm more like a cuddly bear. And Trevor just started laughing. And he's like, that's it. You're the cuddly bears. So, uh, yeah, I kind of stuck. And it's it's just been a fun fun little nickname. Love the cuddles, fear the paws, and uh, just some fun hashtags that I have with it. So. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. It's definitely a quality nickname. So the insight's very much appreciated, for sure, Josh. But definitely want to be mindful of your time as well. It's been great getting some insights from you ahead of what, like I said, from the top is a very intriguing heavyweight fight, for sure. But just curious, though, if there's any final parting thought you might want to add as we're kind of wrapping up here, though. Hey, uh, I'll say the the alpha is not always uh, the biggest man. So uh, I'm... I'm actually really excited for this fight. So that's, uh, I like testing myself and, um, man, I don't think there's anyone better to test yourself against, especially here in bare knuckle than, uh, Ben. So, um, I'm curious how it's going to come out and yeah, I just, I love competing. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Especially cool too, being that it's like getting dubbed like the biggest BKFC card of all time. And there's a lot of discourse around it like that. So it must be cool to, kind of be part of it in that sense as well. It seems like there's like a lot of focus on this particular one and a lot of growth in general. Absolutely. That's I'm, I'm so blessed to be on this card with uh, how many big names are on it. So that's uh, my plan is just go out there, put on a show for everyone. Win or lose, that's, I want to, yeah, I just like, like to see people entertained, so... 
well, the respective track records both of you have, I very much think we're going to be very entertained on April 29th. And thanks so much for the time and insights ahead of BKFC 41 and looking forward to checking out that fight. But until then, you have a good rest of your day there, Josh. Yeah, you too. Thank you. All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, excited to be talking with an individual set for a very intriguing fight at BKFC 41. And that all goes down on April 29th. We've got Josh Copeland knuckling up and towing the line against Ben Rothwell. And great getting to have Ben on the show once again. How are you doing, man? Great, thank you. I was going to say you didn't quite get the fight you seem to be looking for with Christine Faria or Chael Sonnen. So, I mean, but still a fight lined up is probably good, right? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really all about that Christine fight. She was looking kind of mean. So <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was gunning for Chael Sonnen. He looked, he looked easier. I mean, I wouldn't want to be running it with Christine either, so I get where you're coming from on that. But just, you know, speaking to, you know, this fight still staying locked in, like just in the sense of you, you know, still being on the card, like that Josh Watson bout kind of, you know, fell by the wayside. Like when did you, I guess, initially get word about this, you know, Josh Copeland fight kind of, you know, being brought into the picture? Well, I got told Watson was out five minutes before the fight happened. Um, some were trying to say injury, stuff like that. The truth is, he said he didn't agree to fight in Denver. Uh, he said, and that, that part was kind of upsetting because three weeks prior to the press conference, we were announced and it was Denver and we were on a poster, me and him. So I don't understand that. He, he says that they flipped the script on him, that he agreed to the fight, but not Denver. So I don't understand any of that. Doesn't, doesn't look good. It is what it is. About two days later, they had, they decided it was going to be Copeland. Copeland was already on the card. He's already had a fight, and uh, he stepped up. Said he, he said he used, he wants to fight. Said he was he was more excited for that than, than the other than the guy he had. So, all right then, let's do this. And uh, yeah, the fight makes sense because it was me, him, and I are two guys that could have easily fought each other throughout our tenure. You know, when I was in the UFC and when. Him and I were both going through different organizations. Definitely two guys we could have fought earlier before. So here it is. We lined up and we fight for the BKFC and probably the biggest fight card they've ever had. So based on how you're talking about it, it seems like you've at least had the awareness of like who Josh Copeland is, I guess, like resume wise. But in terms of like, I guess, his stylistic attributes, like what do you think some of his better attributes are? Because it seems like you're familiar with him based on how you described him. Yeah, I guess when I'm watching, you know, I, I guess he, he's here in Colorado and they do work a lot on MMA. Uh, so he's kind of versed at everything. Couldn't decide, is he a ground guy? Is he this, is he that? I think at the end of the day, he just likes throwing his hands like I do. So I guess he's kind of similar in, in the same aspect. Um, I don't think he was a big kicker in MMA or anything. I think he kind of caught around his hands and he feels the way I do. BKFC, it's like, oh, that's all we got to worry about. Just throw the hands. Yeah, and a lot to, you know, touch on in that kind of regard, but I also feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't get some, you know, thoughts on the debut there. I didn't get to talk to you after that one there, and I feel like that couldn't have really gone better, at least from my layman perspective, just, you know, dispatching your opponent in less than 20 seconds. Like, what were your main takeaways from, you know, the BKFC debut there? For me, it was necessary. Like, I really wanted to make an impact. I wanted to make myself known. There's a whole group of people that I don't think really knew much about me. There's a bare knuckle group of fans that, you know, might have heard of me but never really watched me fight. And that was the introduction. As far as moving into my next fight, I just try to get it out of my head because, you know, for, for me, that's about as, a, as a, an opening goes. It's like a grand slam. And I don't think there is any redoing that, or up. I don't think you can do it. You, you can't really up that one. So I'm just gonna move on and make new highlights, make something new, exciting to talk about with a uh, with a with a with a tough guy that, um, you know, I don't think he's gonna lay down. He, he he's he's not scared. You know, he's coming into fight, so it makes the fight exciting. It seems, in my perspective, that people are more excited about this fight than the Watson fight. A lot of the media members were just like, ah, oh, Watson, and they didn't even think anything of it. 
and it was really dangerous for me because I'm like, the guy's big and he's dangerous, so I'm supposed to win, but if I don't, then it's, then it's catastrophic. But if I win, it's no big deal. So it's kind of like a lose-lose situation almost. Copeland, it's to everybody's all, oh, it's a great fight, and they're excited for it. So now I feel like I got something to actually win off of this. So it's got me more excited. Yeah, and it's curious because there was an article that was out a bit after your debut and it was saying like you're ready to answer all the call outs but maybe that seems to be a bit of an issue there it feels like not as many people are super enthused about you know jumping in there with you because of the intrinsic danger of all of that so I guess this you know fight would also get you excited in that kind of regard to just having like an eager you know opponent standing opposite you yeah absolutely you know it's a like, like we said quality opponent there's not as many people think like everybody on the internet says they'll fight you, but we know that that doesn't doesn't translate to actually stepping in there and doing it. Yeah, like I did think it was kind of interesting at the press conference that Bobby Lashley supposedly texted Chael Sonnen about wanting to do that. I mean, he's with WWE, obviously, but that definitely got me excited. Just the thought. Sonnen said he texted Bobby Lashley. At Bobby Lashley, Bobby Lashley didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think. He replied, fuck no. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, fair enough. I mean, definitely could get where he's coming from. And, you know. You also said the arena holds 17,000 people, so. <laughs> but it just seems like a great time for, you know, free agency in general and everything. It seems like there's so much opportunity for people, not just in any particular combat sport, but just like the entire you know, space overall. Can you kind of, you know, speak to your experiences within that? Because it seems like this move to BKFC has, you know, really benefited what you're doing. Like you obviously had a great profile for a while, but it seems like you're, you know, really out there now. Like it seems like a good move that was navigated there. First round management, definitely on top of it. So they've done a great job for me. Even when I was with UFC, they did a great job for me. Moving forward, obviously they work with every organization there is, so they, they know the landscape very well. And they're getting they're getting you know not just me with BKFC and, and and BKFC's a major player like they're stepping up, doing some big things. Just with or, or they're getting you know, but there's people getting paid in other organizations too. And I think that really really matters for fighters as a whole. You know, there isn't just one name. There's, there's, there's the big name. It's, you know, everybody looks at that, you get the most recognition from, but at least fighters like myself can make a living and doing stuff elsewhere. So it's, it's, it, for me, it's, it's awesome to see combat sports as a whole. Even with the boxing, boxing got people still talking. Like, I thought boxing five years ago was kind of like not as big of a deal. And now it's like combat sports as a whole, boxing, MMA, bare knuckle boxing. They're, they're bigger and more out there than I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, and it's cool you mentioned gloved boxing because I actually saw you at the, you know, game bread boxing event per some of your social media photos with like Pettis and Aldo and stuff like that. And it seems like BKFC is good about allowing some of their fighters to have some outside opportunity if everything kind of lines up smoothly. Is gloved boxing something that you would be interested in? Like you were talking about how you know, at one point it didn't seem like the sport was like, you know, that popular necessarily, but it seems like there's been a bit of a resurgence in a certain sense. So is that something that you could, you know, see yourself doing or would have some interest for you? Absolutely. It's, it's kind of part of the game. If I want to, I, I feel like some of the real major heavyweights that I want to get a piece of, it's going to have to be glove boxing. I mean, ultimately I think David Feldman wants everything to be bare knuckle, but if we can make an awesome fight where I'm representing bare knuckle in a glove match against one of these top heavyweights in boxing, I think everybody's on board with that. So my job is to continue to make noise and have performances like I've been having, and I think uh, we're going to make some big things happen in the future. Yeah, it seems like you're trying to you know manifest that and put things out in the world, and not even just yourself. Like I saw Nate Diaz tweeted, Ben Rothwell versus Tyson Fury, Real Fight Inc. So yeah, stuff like that fires me up. It seems like a lot of options are out there. Yeah, that was cool of them. Yeah, no, good. Yeah, no, good to see the, you know, respect and everything like that. Nate, also someone who's, you know, been in the game for a while. And I guess I'm curious to, you know, 
get some insights in this regard because I was seeing that in the latest rankings update you were positioned at number three but it seems like sometimes the motivation in this sport is more oriented to like getting like really high level you know fights each time people who have a level of notoriety and I guess commensurate skill I guess I'm curious what your you know path would be if it's oriented to you know pursuing a championship versus say just taking on the toughest challenges and the most intriguing ones on a case-by-case basis uh, right now my contract is how much I get paid, so I don't care about pay reviews or anything like that. So I'm fine with these types of fights right now. Like I said, my job is to perform uh, the next two fights like I did my first fight and get a lot of noise going, get some recognition. And I think moving forward, yeah, we could look for a fight like you're talking about where all that matters, especially some pay-per-view buys. Yeah, for sure. And I guess I'm curious to get some insights on the recent work because it seems like you were, you know, getting in some work alongside Kalen James Hull and Yuri Kaganovsky and certain individuals like that. It seemed like a good mix of, you know, different body types. And you had the post saying, doesn't matter your size, just the size of your heart. Would you say like some of those guys are the main individuals you've been, you know, working alongside in this particular camp here? Yeah, the, the two, Kalen Hall is my, my guy. You always seen with me in my corner the last several years. And then we got a, we brought in another guy, um, Lewis, who I took a picture. There's the three of us together. And they're both they're both taller than me. Everybody's, I'm Big Ben, and they're both bigger than me. So I, it makes me feel good that I got two real heavyweights. One's, one's a, a Golden Gloves champ boxer. He's moving on to pro. Kalen, obviously, I've been developing for the last four years uh, to solid – tough guys, big, skilled, and good work. And then I came here to Colorado for the month, and I found some good training partners here as well, some good heavyweights. So just getting good work wherever I can, just, you know, I'm prepared. And something that I thought was interesting and kind of doing a bit of backgrounding on you and kind of interesting because it slipped under my radar for a little bit, but it's always good to learn things, just seeing that you're also involved in you know, the promoting game and stuff like that, like Ben Ben Rothwell's Wisconsin extreme cage fighting and stuff like that. Can you speak to, you know, some of those experiences and stuff like that? It seemed like you had a great hometown crowd like a couple months ago, a few weeks ago sort of thing. Yeah, that was my ninth one. Um, we, unfortunately, as the COVID shut it down, I did eat and then COVID happened. Um, so that was my first one back. It's taken that long because unfortunately, Kenosha and the scene just... We're super slow at getting everything going again. Racine was actually really bad. It's where it's where that we hosted the fights. Uh, just so much with the restrictions and stuff that it was just like there's no way I could do it. But finally things cleared up, the stars aligned, and uh, we had we hit a home run. You know, we sold it out. We I could have sold easily another thousand tickets um, on a small show. You know, when you're dealing with a couple thousand, it's a lot for a small show. So. We're, we're happy uh, we had that kind of response like I'm literally like I couldn't I needed a bigger arena for this one uh, it was that kind of a hit I just think people were like so excited to just get out and do things again we had great fights um, but it's stressful but see like I know other fighters that like, put their names on organizations but I literally do everything like I book everything i deal with the commission i deal with medicals i match make half of the card with another matchmaker hire i get the lighting i get the announcer i book the insurance like i do I, like i am the promoter and a lot of these guys are like oh yeah promoting and they don't do anything they, <laughs> show, they fly in and show up to the event and then get paid you know that's not the same thing like i actually did it like i put it all together it's my name on the license you know, so I take them, and I enjoy it. That's why it's my point is I really enjoy that. I know all aspects of combat sports. You know, I've managed fighters. I've obviously fought at the highest level, but I can also know what it's like behind the scenes of promoting the show, dealing with the ticket sales. So it's pretty cool. I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, and it seems like there's multiple cool parts of it, like providing a platform for young upcoming fighters would obviously be a great thing but i'm sure it's like really you know fleshed out your understanding of the game like i'm in your days as a competitor i mean obviously tremendous knowledge accrued but i would think just what you've done in that promoter capacity for the last decade has like really even informed that 
even more? Like, would you say that like what you've learned from promoting has at all, I guess, benefited your career as a fighter, just the comprehensiveness of the knowledge, I guess? Yeah, more for me, it's like my management. Um, I know where they're coming. Like I understand and I'll, I know what a promotion is going through the night of the fight and how much moving parts are going on. And like, I guess I have a better understanding. So I know when to relax, but as far as helping, becoming a promoter as a manager, helping my fighters, because I know, I know what other shows are making. I know what kind of money's getting thrown around. I know what guys are supposed to get paid. I know a little bit more about matchups. So I feel like helping my fighters and being a manager, it tenfold helped all of that for sure. They, they're like, Oh man, you know, we can barely do 500 bucks. And I'm like, what's, What's the capacity? What's your ticket sales at? I'm like, don't bullshit me. I'm like, you can't fucking play that shit with me because I know the, I know what's going on. So, I, I think it, it's like a, it, it might cause problems at the same time, but it's still, it's always going to benefit me no matter what. It causes problems for them more so. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like you're advocating for these guys to you know get their fair share. So cool of you to use your knowledge and profile to do that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that but i get what you mean maybe some people are not looking to you know drop the cash or whatever but it's like people should be getting paid their fair wage you know what i mean it's all about making money and you know anything that's a, that affects their bottom line of course you're not gonna be happy with it but i understand all that now yeah for sure love to you know hear about that and everything for sure but yeah, no, it's been great having you on, man. I appreciate you giving such great insights leading into this fight. And like I was saying before, during fight week and everything, no less. I guess one of the last questions that I had, because I was noticing after the last fight, it seemed like you were able to get in some time at your favorite restaurant and enjoy some Brazilian steakhouse. Is that the plan for after this one, too? Yeah, it's my favorite. You know it. That is my very... And the one in Schaumburg, Schaumburg, Illinois. I love... Fog I like. I go to Fogo de Chalos in Texas State, Brazil's other places but texas day brazil is probably my favorite of them and the texas day brazil in schaumburg illinois is the best and i've been to a lot as you can see uh, that is my favorite so yeah, hell yeah that's, <laughs> that's the place to go i was gonna say do you have any particular like go-to sort of thing or is it almost like difficult to pick like it's like there's maybe like a top five at the brazilian steakhouse oh i have my favorites for sure i love lamb chops um, they got some of the, and you can eat as many as you want. Uh, so going to a restaurant, lamb chops can get super expensive. And there, it's like you pay one price to eat as many lamb chops as you can want. So, yeah, I love that. But flank steak, um, they make, it's a, like a bottom sirloin is one of the best. Their house special is super good. So, I mean, there's nothing I don't like. Like, even some of the porks and stuff, and I don't, like, like as much, they're still excellent. Like, they taste very good. And it is kind of cool bringing people. And my the, the very favorite thing to do is bring someone that's never been there before. That's cool because they just get they just absolutely get blown away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first time I ever went, that was very much the case for me. But like I was saying before, I want to be you know mindful of your time and schedule, Ben. So to that point, is there maybe any final parting thought you might want to add as we're wrapping up here, man? Just, hey, thanks for getting us out there. You know, I appreciate the media always. We, you know, we work together. First Round Management, Condemned Labs is my supplement company working with. Rock Woman Maze, my gym in Jimmy Kenosha, Wisconsin. If you're around, stop by. And that's it, man. Thank you. Yeah, and it looks like the Guerrilla Warfare apparel is pretty good for you. It looks like you got a new shirt out there, too. That has been kaposhed. They were officially banned from Bare Knuckle uh, about a week ago. Oh, well, sorry to hear about that. Hopefully some other... <laughs> <laughs> Sucks for that. I mean, I had a relationship with the owner. Uh, it's sad. But, uh, yeah, they... No more, no more of that. No more, no more, no more sponsors than them, so... Oh, well, you know, it is what it is, I suppose. But great getting to, you know, have you on the show, especially ahead of such an intriguing fight here. Like we were saying, I think both of you really have cool individual profiles and should be a great fight on April 29th here. So thanks so much for coming on, man. And you have a good rest of your day there, too. Thank you, sir. You too.